Hi, Stephen Hand from Staccata in Hobart. In this fifth part of my series on George Silver's True and False Times and the common misconceptions surrounding them, I want to look at, at attacks. Right? I want to look at the attacks that Silver describes in his uh, Paradoxes of Defence and Brief Instructions upon my Paradoxes of Defence. And I'm going to start by showing you a series of attacks, each of which is explicitly described in uh, one of Silver's works. So as you can see, there are a huge number of attacks described in Silver's system. But Silver doesn't specifically tell you to do them. In fact, he doesn't tell you to do any attack out of any fight any, at any time. The only time he tells you to make an offensive action, every single offensive action he tells specifically says you should do this, it's a riposte after a parry or a counter-attack. It's never an initial attack. Now, we can take this to mean one of two things. We can either assume that Silver never intended for you to make any attacks, or we can assume that this is simply the way that Silver framed his, his treatise two works, uh, that he favoured the defence, which is pretty clear, uh, and that attacks, people know how to attack, all right? He doesn't have to explain how to do those, he's just explaining the defences, all right? And then in some cases he shows, he talks about how to deceive the defences, all right? So he starts where he thinks the, where he thinks the audience is going to need him to start. So those are the two possibilities. Either he, he never wanted you to attack or that he's just simply framing the manual that way and of course he wanted you to attack. So, do we have any evidence which would suggest which one of those Silver was more likely to favour? Well, yes we do. If Silver didn't intend you to attack, it would be highly unlikely that he'd have a big section in one of his works telling you to attack. But that's precisely what he does have. In Paradox 8, Silver has uh, basically a large section where he says there are some people who say that the attacker has the advantage, there are some people who say the defender has the advantage, and in fact my conclusion is that no one has the advantage. And I'll give that entire passage to you now. George Silver, his resolution upon that hidden or doubtful question, who hath the advantage of the offender or defender? The advantage is strongly holden of many to be in the offender, yea, in so much that if two mind it, minding to offend in their fight, it is thought to be in him that first striketh or thrusteth. Others strongly hold opinion that the warder absolutely hath still the advantage. But these opinions as they are contrary the one to the other, 
so are they contrary to true fight, as may well be seen by these short examples. If the advantage be in the water, then it is not good any time to strike or thrust. If the advantage be in the striker or thruster, then were it a frivolous thing to learn to ward, or at any time to seek to ward, since in warding lies this advantage. Now may it plainly by these examples appear that if there is any perfection in fight, that both sides are deceived of their opinions, because if the striker or thruster hath the advantage, then is the warder still in danger of wounds or death. And again, if the warder hath the advantage, then is the striker or thrust in as great danger to defend himself against the warder, because the warder from his wards taketh advantage of the striker or thruster upon every blow or thrust that shall be made against him. Then, thus do I conclude, that if there be perfection in the science of defence, they are all in their opinions deceived, and that the truth may appear for the satisfaction of all men. This is my resolution. There is no advantage, absolutely, nor a disadvantage, in striker, thruster, or warder. And there is great advantage in the striker, thruster, and warder. But in this manner, in the perfection of fight, the advantage consisteth in fight between party and party. That is, Whosoever winneth or gaineth the place in true pace, space, and time hath the advantage, whether he be the striker, thruster, or warder. And that is my resolution. So clearly, Silver intended you to attack. He's telling you that explicitly in Paradox 8. So clearly, all those descriptions of attacks are not put in there just to tell you what the other idiots do because you're never intended to attack. They're just describing the way people fight, right? They're describing attacks, and you're expected to use attacks. So how are you going to attack? Well, clearly you're going to attack using one of the four true times. You're either going to attack using time of the hand, time of the hand and body, time of the hand, body and foot, Right? Time of the hand, body and feet. So, clearly, Silver is telling you to attack. How are you going to attack? Of course you're going to attack using one of the times that he's told you, you need to use. So, therein come the other three true times, other than just time of the hand. One of the arguments that I've heard put to defend um, the assertion that some people make that Silver made no attacks um, is the assertion that Silver says that he's different to the Italians and this somehow seems to justify any sort of weird aberration. Silver says he's different to the Italians, the Italians attacked uh, on steps and passes therefore Silver didn't attack on, a step or, or on steps or, and passes. Um, the Italian Silver City was different to the Italians. The Italians um, made attacks, therefore Silver mustn't have made attacks. Um, this is the this is actually one of the classical logical fallacies. It's the fallacy of the non sequitur. It doesn't follow. Uh, I mean, we may as well say um, Silver City was different to the Italians. The Italians were humans, therefore Silver must have been an alien. I mean, it makes no sense. It simply doesn't follow. What Silver, so how was Silver different to the Italians? Well, he outlines in Paradoxes 2 and 3, in Paradoxes of Defence, he outlines 10 ways in which he was different to the Italians, none of which include not stepping or passing, right? none of which include um, not actually making attacks. So to say that um, he says he's different to the Italians, therefore he must be different in every conceivable way is just a it's an argument beyond ludicrous. It's, um, it just simply doesn't follow. He explains how he's different to the Italians, 10 different ways. Um, we should be quite happy with that. In the final and concluding part of this video series on Silver's true and false times and some of the misconceptions arising from them, I'm going to look at one aspect of Silver's fight that 
people who have a differing interpretation of silver to me latch onto as being the only way you can attack if for some reason you're not allowed to attack by moving the feet. Uh, which, as you've seen from my series, is absolutely not what Silver's telling you to do. Uh, and I'll look at the arguments they make and look at their validity or otherwise. Thanks for watching.